Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started by welcoming all of you guys. Sawadee Kap, welcome to Watung Yu. Welcome to our class and our course this week, Monday through Friday this week. I'm going to be sharing the teachings with you guys to help you understand what the Buddha taught and how to make your way to the enlightened mental state. And the way that I usually like to start this course is just by sharing something with you that I share with all students. And I think all of you guys might have actually heard this, except for maybe you, Sherry, you haven't heard, heard me share this yet, is that when you're approaching the teachings of the Buddha, it's important that you don't believe his teachings. Everything that I share this week, don't believe anything that I share because belief, you don't know what's true or false. And this isn't going to help you to get to enlightenment if you just believe things. Instead, you're looking to get to wisdom. What wisdom is, is when you can learn something intellectually, you can reflect on it to independently verify it, and then you can practice it and see the truth for yourself through independent verification that what's being shared is the truth. So what the Buddha did is, he didn't share the way the world should be and that if everybody follows these rules and commandments then the world's going to become a peaceful place instead he's explaining the way the world is and by you understanding the way the world is you'll navigate the world with that wisdom and your mind will be peaceful and calm and serene and content with joy as it moves to this enlightened mental state ultimately getting to the point where you're never experiencing any anger sadness frustration irritation annoyance guilt shame fear stress anxiety loneliness, boredom, shyness, resentment, jealousy, all these feelings and others are completely eliminated from the enlightened mind. And you do that through acquiring wisdom. You can't believe your way to enlightenment. You need to be able to cultivate the mind through learning, reflecting, and practicing. You're awakening to these natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught. Because when you make wise decisions, it will produce wholesome results in your life. But when we make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results. And with a lack of wisdom, we'll naturally make unwise decisions that produce as unwholesome results. So what we're doing on this path is you're learning, you're reflecting, independently verifying, you're practicing in order to train the mind to acquire this wisdom and now as you awaken more and more to the world around you, you're not struggling and you're not having difficulties. Whenever your mind's having struggles or difficulties, there's just some lack of wisdom that the mind has. And because of that, it's going to experience those discontent feelings. So as you're awakening, you're gaining this wisdom of these natural laws. And the same thing ha has happened as it relates to other natural laws. At one point, none of us understood the natural law of gravity, right? When we were one year old, two years old, three years old, we didn't understand the natural law of gravity and we struggled with it. We had difficulties. We fell down, we hit our head, we bumped our elbows, we maybe broke open our knees, uh, we broke our toys. We had all kinds of difficulties with this natural law of gravity, but slowly but surely we gained wisdom of this natural law. We didn't believe somebody that this natural law existed. We could see the truth for ourselves that it was really functioning. And we started learning to do things more wisely. We started tying our shoes a bit tighter. We started looking at the surface of the sidewalk as we were walking. We stopped being so giddy and bouncing around all the time. And slowly but surely, we gained the wisdom to make wise decisions to do things like climb a ladder and ride a bicycle and get on airplanes and fly all over the place. We understood this natural law of gravity and we naturally made wiser decisions based on that wisdom. Not because anybody told us any rules or commandments <clears throat> about the natural law of gravity, but we just had this wisdom so we naturally made wiser decisions. So like even me, like there's this glass of water that I put behind me. Nobody told me to do that. That's not a rule or a commandment or anything, but I know if I put that in front of me, it's going to easily spill, right? I'll probably tip it over at some point. So when you understand the natural laws, you're going to naturally make wiser decisions on your own without anybody even telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing. So this path to enlightenment, it's not about other people telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing. Instead, it's you cultivating wisdom of these natural laws so you can more readily make your way to this wisdom and awaken to the wisdom so that then you can train your mind and experience the peace and joy on the enlightenment of the enlightened mind. And that's why you shouldn't believe anything that I say or anything that I teach you, anything I write in books or anything like this. So gradually you're learning, you're reflecting, and you're practicing. One of the biggest myths in in the life story of the Buddha is some people think that he sat under a tree, he meditated and instantly got to enlightenment. But this isn't actually true. If you read his original teachings, you can see where it was gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress that he made his way to enlightenment. And you know that to be true because everything you've ever done in life has been that way, where you've needed to gradually learn how to read, write and speak English, right? Even if you're a native speaker, we had to gradually do that. Gradual learning, gradual practice and 
gradual progress, whether it's a job or occupation, it was the same thing. It was this gradual learning, gradual practice and gradual progress. So on this path to enlightenment, what you come to realize when you first start on this path is this is your journey to enlightenment. It's you're the, your own independent practitioner, right? You're the one who's making your way to enlightenment. A teacher is essentially like a tour guide pointing out the way, but it's you that's doing the work. You're not a follower. You're not a devotee or anything like that. Instead, you're a practitioner who's learning, developing your mind. You're working to understand the wisdom of the Buddha so that you can awaken to that wisdom and now you'll naturally make wiser and wiser decisions in your life. So we're going to be talking about many different topics throughout the week and we even have a tour the very last day. I invite students to a tour. We even have something special today that we organize. There's a, a temple game fun night. If you guys would like to stick around this evening at 6 p.m. we're going to be playing some games. There's going to be people showing up. We're going to be playing some different games. You guys are welcome to hang out for that as well. Uh, so we've got lots of different activities this week. It'll be wonderful to get time to spend with all of you guys, get to know you better. You know, maybe we go to lunch or maybe we spend some time after class here or there, get to know each other. So make yourself comfortable. Uh, here at the temple, we have a bathroom in the back of the room. If you would like to use the restroom at any point, go ahead. Feel free to use the restroom. It's the last door on the right. I'll be taking breaks at different points during the, the, the class. I usually take a mid-morning break and a lunch break, and I give you guys lots of time to talk and interact. But also, at any time, feel free to get up and use the restroom. There's even restrooms outside the classroom. If you follow the main signs uh, around to the main bathrooms, you'll be able to see those as well. And then we have water here that is provided by our students that you're welcome to help yourself to as well. So oftentimes I will start these classes and stuff with meditation. Some of you guys are used to that. But here on the first day of this course, I actually don't do meditation because I'm going to introduce you to the course and help you understand what the course is all about. And I'd also like to welcome all of you guys that are online who are joining us as well. This is a five-day course where you can learn the teachings of the Buddha and the foundational teachings. You'll even be able to ask questions as well as we go and help you to learn the teachings and get clarification. So this is a 30-hour course. We meet at 9 a.m. each morning, and typically we'll be starting with meditation each morning, uh, and that's usually the way we'll start. Rex actually came for uh, meditation. They're all looking at you like, why is he leaving? We just started. He came for meditation. Um, so he's heading out. Don't, no worries, just some impermanence, right? Um, so we usually will start, or we will start each day at 9 a.m., but we'll usually start with meditation each morning. And then we usually take a mid-morning break somewhere around 10, 30, 11, depending on uh, what's going on. And then we take usually about an hour and a half lunch break, and we have some time in the afternoon when we finish up around three o'clock. This is my contact information. I don't know that you necessarily need this, but sometimes students ask for it at the beginning of a class. This is my contact information. You can get this same information on our website as well. You'll see that I have all this same stuff on our website. So if you go to our website, buddhadailywisdom.com, you can see it there. If you're not able to come to class one day or another, you don't need to let me know. I mean, you can if you'd like, it's up to you, but don't feel free. Don't feel like you have to let me know uh, unless you'd like to, it's up to you. Um, but you can come and go as you please. You, you'll probably find that over the course of this week that there'll be people who will be coming and people who will be leaving. Uh, I have an open door policy. People come and go all the time. So you'll see different people coming and going. Um, so feel free to let me know if you like, but you don't need to. You're not required to because it's just impermanence. There'll be people coming and going all throughout the week. But this is uh, my contact information, not just for the course, but after the course, right? You're going to most likely be interested in having continued support. So so maybe you would like to contact me for some reason after the course and you've got that information there. So in terms of the way the course is structured is I start off this morning with welcome and kind of introducing you to the course. And then in terms of our schedule, normally each morning we start at 9 a.m. and we do the chanting and meditation together. And I'm going to help you to build up your meditation practice slowly but surely. We're going to gradually expand that over the course of the week, helping you build up to a longer and longer meditation session. And then after the meditation around 930, I'll start providing some teachings about the teachings of the Buddha because you wouldn't be able to just meditate your way to enlightenment. You're going to need to learn other things. And this course is focused on the foundational teachings. Some people refer to this as a Dhamma talk. You might have heard that. The word Dhamma means teachings. Uh, this is a Pali word. So teachings talk sounds a little bit odd. So I just call this uh, teachings and discussion because I see it as a discussion. It's not a lecture. It's not a sermon. It's not anything like that. It's a discussion where I'm sharing 
sharing teachings with you and then providing you an opportunity to ask questions, right? But be sure you remember that you're a student, right? You're here to learn perhaps, and that's the best way for you to get the most benefit out of the course rather than trying to teach other people who haven't asked you anything or rather than try to teach me something that you feel like you know. It's better for you to, to be a student and focus on being a student and asking questions. And if something that I'm sharing with you is different than what you currently understand, which I'm sure it will be, then ask questions and get clarification. If you're in a classroom with a teacher that's sharing things with you that you know everything that that teacher is sharing, you're in the wrong classroom because you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not evolving. If a teacher is sharing something with you that conflicts with something that you currently understand or maybe think you understand, this is wonderful. Because if you're in a classroom where what is being shared with you is opposite or different than what you currently understand, that's an opportunity for you to ask questions and get insight and then try to understand further what that person's sharing with you. So where you hear things that are different than what you currently understand, I encourage you to ask questions and see clarification on those things. And I'm sure you'll see plenty of things throughout the week that are different than what you currently feel like you understand about the world. And that's really good because that's opportunity for you to grow and evolve as an individual. And then usually around 12 o'clock, we take a lunch. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit earlier, sometimes it's a little bit later, it just depends on what's going on in the class. And there's gonna be a mid-morning break somewhere in here around 10.30 or 11, we'll take a break. But we usually take a lunch somewhere around 12, maybe a little bit earlier or later. But then we come back in the afternoon and I'll let you know each time when we go to lunch what time we're coming back in the afternoon. It's typically around 1.30, but sometimes it's a little bit different depending on when we are headed out to lunch. But in the afternoon, I tend to focus on meditation and teaching you about meditation. And we'll be doing meditation together too. So we do meditation in the morning and then a bit of teaching, some breaks, and then some lunch. And then we come back, do some more meditation and some more teaching but the teaching in the afternoon is focused on meditation so you'll see that as we go so over the course of the week you'll kind of get into the habit of meditating twice a day and then if you meditate in the in the evening at home that can be a third meditation for you and gradually slowly but surely you can build up your practice to two or three sessions per day and you can see how it affects your mind and improves the condition of your mind during the course of the week and then we usually finish around three o'clock. Again, sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Uh, it's very rare that we would go later than 10, uh, 3, 10 or 3.15 or something like that. Um, it, it just depends on what kind of questions are going on in the class, but typically we're finishing right around three o'clock. Uh, so, but if at any point you need to leave right at three or 3.45 or I'm sorry, 2.45 or whatever time you need to come and go, it's up to you. Right, it's your life, it's your decisions. You decide when you would like to be here when you're not interested in being here. And you just make those choices on your own and come and go as you please. But this is kind of the basic structure of the schedule of the class and the course. And then on the fifth day, there's a field trip that I invite students to where for four days you learn here in the classroom. And then on the fifth day, I invite you out to the temples, Wat Umong and Wat Doi Sutep. Wat Umong is a forest temple and Wat Doi Sutep, it's up on the mountain and it's a different Different type of temple because there's two different branches of Buddhism here in Thailand and by visiting two different branches of Buddhism on the same day you can see the differences very clearly so this has helped you to be able to learn the teachings of the Buddha so I teach you through the symbolism and the architecture and the artwork at a temple if you've never visited a temple with somebody who understands those kinds of things it can be really illuminating to help you so that then when you go to temples you'll be able to understand what you see oftentimes when a person goes to a temple that's never been to one it's like, oh, that's pretty, that's beautiful. You might just take a couple of pictures. But if you actually understand the symbolism, the architecture and the artwork of a, of a temple, it kind of speaks to you. It's kind of like a living library. It's like a classroom without walls. And one of the things that the Thai people do on their holidays is if they go to a different region of Thailand, they will go visit different temples and they will kind of be like a little bit of a scavenger hunt, like a little bit of an investigative uh, trip where you go into a temple and you try to decode what these people were trying to communicate 500 years ago or a thousand years ago when they built these temples, they're sharing teachings of the Buddha through the artwork, the architecture and the symbolism. And if you understand a little bit of this, the temple kind of speaks to you when you go into a temple, the walls, the architecture, the artwork, when you walk around a temple, it kind of speaks to you if you understand the language. So after you learn the teachings of the Buddha for four days, I can take you to these two different temples and I can walk you around and kind of 
teach you the language of the architecture, the symbolism, and the artwork. And then any temple you visit, it'll really speak to you and you'll understand what it is that people were communicating so many years ago as they were building these temples. Then this course is based on this particular book. It's called Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. It's part of the Words of the Buddha book series, and I have versions of it here uh, at the temple if you would like a printed version. There is also available online for free. You can download it from our website at no cost. You can take it and go print it if you like, or you can get a version on Amazon if you have access to Amazon in your country. So this book is kind of like the guide or the base for this particular course. And all the foundational programs that I teach. It's this volume one, but in this particular course, we're not going to be covering the entire book. It's just these chapters here, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 19. This is, these are the ones that we're going to be discussing here because this is what you need for the foundational aspects of the teachings. But then I have other programs where you'll be able to learn the entire book if you like. There's a program that meets on Sundays and Wednesdays called the group learning program where I go chapter by chapter in this book over a seven month period and gradually helping you learn the entire book all the way through. And then I have other programs that go through volumes two through 13, all the other books. So we'll talk about that towards the end of the course. I'll talk about the continued uh, support and even that field trip at some point, probably on Thursday, we'll probably be talking about the field trip and I'll give you guys more details about the field trip. And you guys are welcome to come. And even if you encounter other people who aren't even here at the course right now, they're welcome to come as well because you might be at a smoothing bar or you might be at the a lobby of your hotel having breakfast and somebody's like, hey, what are you doing? They might be interested in coming along either to the tour or they might be interested in joining the course or what have you. And as you see those kinds of things happening, people are more than welcome to come at any point. You'll see people showing up on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday that haven't been here on Monday or Tuesday, and that's completely fine. Whenever people find out about what we're doing here, they're more than welcome to join. And this book will help guide you in your learning and your development. So it's available in all these different formats, PDF, Kindle, in print, and it's the first book of a 13 book book series. And it's uh, wise to acquire one of these that you can be reading the book along the way. And if you're not reading it now uh, or you haven't read it before the course, you can surely read it after the course as well. That's an option for you. Uh, what we're going to be discussing in terms of what you'll be learning in the course is this morning, I'm going to be starting off with having a, a discussion about the life story of Gautama Buddha. If you're embarking on this journey potentially to learn and practice his teachings to be able to get to enlightenment, you probably have some interest in learning a little bit about his life story and what did he do during his life. So I'm going to share that with you to help you understand a bit of his life story. Then I'm going to share with you about enlightenment and what is enlightenment. It's kind of like if you were on your way to a certain city, say somebody came to you and said, hey, uh, you should travel to Chiang Rai. It's a really great city. You'd probably be interested like, well, what's in Chiang Mai? What's or, or what Chiang Rai? What's it about? You know, wh what's going on there? And you would need to some information about what Chiang Rai is before you ever decide to embark on this journey to go to Chiang Rai. So I'm going to give you this information about what enlightenment is so you can understand a little bit about it before you even embark on this journey that headed towards enlightenment. And one of the benefits of that is if you understand what enlightenment is, you'll be more able to navigate your way to it. And then once you arrive, you'll be more likely to know that you're there, right? Just like Chiang Rai. If somebody uh, shared something about Chiang Rai with you, if you understood the, the streets and the parks and what's there, uh, you'll be able to more readily navigate your way to Chiang Rai. And then once you're there, you'll know that you're there. And the same thing is true with enlightenment. So we're going to be talking about what enlightenment is uh, after we talk about the life story of Gautama Buddha. And then tomorrow, I'm going to be sharing with you the very first teaching of the Buddha. It's called the Four Noble Truths. This is where you're establishing right view so that you can understand the problem in the unenlightened mind, the cause of that problem, the elimination of it, and the path forward of how to completely eliminate the problem in the mind. This is the very first teaching of the Buddha. It's four simple statements that you can independently verify. And this is where you can have a breakthrough to finally understanding why your mind experiences anger and sadness and frustration and all these other discontent feelings. And once you understand what's causing it, then you can learn how to eliminate it as well. But you wouldn't know how to 
eliminated if you didn't know what was causing it. So in these four simple statements, you'll be able to understand what's causing the problem in the unenlightened mind so that then you can understand how to actually eliminate it. That's the first part of learning the teachings of the Buddha. Then I'm going to share with you the Eightfold Path. This is the path for all humans to enlightenment. This is a very detailed teaching where I'm going to be sharing with you the original words of the Buddha and walking you through piece by piece by piece these eight individual factors. This is a core central teaching of the Buddha that everything else plugs into. You wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment through the teachings of the Buddha without understanding the Eightfold Path. Inside and out, backwards and forwards, up, down, left, right, you would need to understand this eightfold path. So I'm going to walk you through that, helping you to understand it. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to share with you what's called the transforming the three poisons, craving, anger, and ignorance. The Four Noble Truths gives you a bit of a window into the unenlightened mind and the Buddha gets right to the heart of what the issue is in the unenlightened mind and what's causing that. But it's the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires that kind of broaden your understanding and also deepen your understanding of what's truly going on in the unenlightened mind. So I'm going to be sharing that with you on Wednesday. And I'm going to not only share with you what the problems are, but the solutions of how to remedy these or how to antidote these and uproot them out of the mind. And then also on Wednesday, we'll be studying the five precepts. This is a householder's guide to daily practice. Oftentimes people think that the Buddha taught no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicants. If you heard this about the teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha actually didn't teach that. That sounds like rules. It sounds like commandments. It sounds like a bunch of black and white things. So I'm going to be sharing with you the original words of the Buddha where you can see what he taught on this important topic. This topic is five impactful decisions that you can make either wisely or unwisely. And depending on how you make these decisions, you'll experience either wholesome results or unwholesome results. So we're going to use the original language, the original words of the Buddha, and then I'm going to show you how to apply it in day-to-day -day life based on things that you're going to encounter in day-to-day -day life so that you'll understand how to apply it in your actual life. So that'll take us up to Wednesday. Then on Thursday, I'm going to share with you what is karma and how does it affect me? Some people refer to this as karma, if you've ever heard that word. That's from the Sanskrit language. The original teachings of the Buddha are in the Pali language. So people who study the original teachings of the Buddha will tend to use this word karma. Everything the Buddha taught in one way or another is coming back to this natural law of gamma. So as I'm teaching you the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, all these things are exposing you to the natural law of gamma. But on Thursday morning, we're going to go in and talk about the natural law of gamma directly and specifically about the natural law itself. So you'll get an intricate understanding of what the natural law of gamma is. Then we'll talk about what is merit and we'll be discussing continuous support on your journey to enlightenment and how to continue to receive support beyond this course because nobody's going to be enlightened in five days, but you'll have a foundation to be able to work your way towards that. And one of the things that you'll need is continuous support. So I'll show you how to be able to acquire continued support. Then there's um, meditation training and development that we're going to be doing in this course. Primarily, we're going to be focused on breathing mindfulness meditation. This is the primary training that the Buddha taught. I'm going to be doing that with you this morning. I mean, uh, this afternoon. And then tomorrow morning, I'm also going to be doing it with you as well. But then tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be teaching it to you in detail. So I have you experience breathing mindfulness meditation twice this afternoon and tomorrow morning before I actually start teaching it to you. So then you have a frame of reference to understand once I start teaching it to you, you have a better understanding. This afternoon, I'm going to be teaching you Buddhist chanting so that you'll understand what chanting is all about and why we do it and what's the purpose of it and what's the benefit of it. As you're learning meditation, we'll be learning this seated, lying, standing, and walking positions. I'm going to be teaching you walking meditation on Wednesday afternoon because this is a meditation. If you have an overactive mind or an anxious mind or lots of energy in your mind, the last thing you're thinking about doing is being still sitting somewhere. Walking meditation is really good for you. Or if you're having difficulties falling asleep in your meditation, walking meditation is also really good for you. So I'm going to explain to you these four different positions and how you actually use them. And then you'll get an opportunity to use these four different positions during the course. So so then you can kind of dabble with it and kind of see in what situations does it work best for you. Because you're not going to be able to meditate in the same exact position all the time. It's just not possible. There was a period of time where I got in a motorbike accident and I couldn't sit. I couldn't cross my legs. But I understood lying meditation. So when I was lying in the hospital with an IV hooked up to my arm, 
I could still meditate. So if you don't understand all these four positions, you'll be able to meditate anywhere, anytime, right? So the body is impermanent. You're going to experience these kinds of things sometimes. So you're going to need these different positions at different times. So we'll talk about those. And then I'm going to share with you how to integrate these teachings into your life. That's a discussion that we're going to be doing as part of this course as well. So do you guys have any questions on the course content or what we're going to be talking about over the next five days? No? For those of you guys online, if you guys would like to ask questions, you're welcome to do that by putting it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions online either. All right. So let's talk about the life story of the Buddha. This is chapter 19 in that first volume of the book, and it's titled The Difficult Human Existence, Sickness, Aging, and Death. And the reason why it's called this is because these are some of the motivating factors that motivated the Buddha to be able to go on this journey to enlightenment. It sounds kind of ominous, right? Like, oh, the human existence is so difficult. Well, it's difficult in the unenlightened state when you're experiencing the anger and the sadness and the frustration. That's the real difficulty. But getting to enlightenment, once you get to enlightenment, life is wonderful. But in the process of getting there, there can be a certain amount of misery or sorrow or grief or pain or displeasure that someone experiences. So the Buddha observed this as part of his experiences in life, which ultimately motivated him to get to the enlightened mind, because when he was born, he was unenlightened too, and he experienced sorrow and grief and pain and displeasure. So I'm going to explain to you his life story and helping you understand how his life progressed. So I'm going to organize this talk by talking about his birth, his early life, his journey to enlightenment, and then his teaching and his teaching career. And then we'll talk about sickness, aging, and death. So this person that we refer to as Gautama Buddha, he was born as Siddhartha Gautama. That was his name when he was, he was born. He was born into a royal family. His mom was the queen and his dad was the king. And he was the firstborn son. So he was destined to become the king. He was the prince. And when he was born, his mom uh, was living with the king, of course. But during this time frame, when you were a woman and you were pregnant, they would take you back to your homeland in order to give birth. So they organized this caravan to take her back to her parents' house house in order to give birth. And on the way to her parents' house, she goes into labor and they need to stop the caravan and she gets out. She goes over to this tree and she holds on to the branch of a tree and she's trying to deliver this baby standing up. And the baby was having difficulties coming out of the normal birthing canal. So the baby ends up breaking through the side of her stomach and was born this way. And she ends up dying seven days later because this was over 2,500 years ago. This was 563 BCE that this occurred. Today, we would have just done a C-section and would have been no problem. But 2,500 years ago, that technology didn't exist yet. So she ends up dying seven days later. And it wasn't uncommon for either the mother or even the baby to die during childbirth during that period of time. So they had protocols in place that if the mother would die, her siblings would end up adopting the child to be her own. So his mother had an older sister who ends up adopting Siddhartha Gautama. Essentially his aunt became his stepmother. And this is the woman who actually raised him as her own child. And it's said during his lifetime that when he was born, he walked seven steps, lotus flowers were blossoming under his feet, and he spoke and he said, this will be my last life. This is actually in the original teachings of the Buddha in the Pali Canon. But I don't suspect that this is actually true because if this is true, the next part of the story wouldn't be needed because when there's someone so impactful like a Buddha that comes into the world and shares teachings, as stories are being handed down from person to person to person and books are being handed down, oftentimes people embellish the story a little bit in order to make the person look even better than they already are. We don't need to embellish the story of the Buddha. He did some amazing things. And I suspect that they embellished the story because if you had a child that was born and they walked seven steps and lotus flowers were blossoming under their feet and they started speaking, you wouldn't need the next part of the story because the next part of the story is that 
Siddhartha Gautama's father was interested to know what his son was going to become. And he kind of summoned fortune and tellers to come tell him, you know, what's going to happen with my son? Well, if your son was walking and lotus flowers were blossoming and they were speaking right away after they were born, you pretty much know this is a pretty special child, right? You wouldn't need fortune tellers to come tell you or advisors to come tell you what's going to happen with your child. So there was 108 advisors that came and advised the king of what his son was going to become. 107 of those advisors told the king that your son is going to be this great monarch, this great ruler. He was going to rule over your kingdom and expand your territory. And his father's like, hmm, that's my boy. Yeah, okay. Like, that's what the king wants to hear. Well, the very last advisor who came in, the 108th advisor, he came in and he apologized to the king. He said, sir, I'm so sorry to deliver this news to you. The other advisors are accurate. Your son is going to be a great leader. That's 100% true. But he's not going to be a leader in the way that you think he's going to be a leader. He's going to be a spiritual leader. And his father didn't like this. So he decides that just in case this one advisor was true and accurate, he sequestered his son into the palace and never let him go outside and get interested in worldly affairs. He felt like if he went outside and got interested in worldly affairs, that he would become a spiritual leader potentially. And he was interested in being a ruler and a monarch and, and inheriting the throne. So he tries to lavish him with this life of luxury that he would never be able to acquire any other way. So he gives him all this great food and great fabrics and entertainment, beautiful women bathing him and taking care of him from when he was an infant all the way until he was getting older. He gave him this lap of luxury. If you can imagine the royal riches of what a king would able be able to do, he gave everything and anything to his son because he was interested in his mind getting attached essentially to these uh, way of being a monarch, kind of woo him into the ways of being a monarch. Well, after doing this for 29 years and being sequestered in the palace, Siddhartha Gautama was about to become the king because during this lifetime, you would become the king when you were 30 years old and your father would retire. And then they would kind of help you to learn how to become a king. So at the age of 29, Siddhartha Gautama realizing that he was about to become the king and he had never been outside the palace and how could he rule over people and a population of people that he'd never even been outside the palace, he decides against his father's knowledge and wishes to go outside the palace. And when he goes outside the palace, he takes with him his royal attendant. This is kind of like his chief of staff. And he goes with him outside the into the kingdom. And he makes what's called the four observations. These four observations are that he sees a sickly person, an aging person, he sees a dead corpse, and then he sees a roaming aesthetic, someone who's given up life and worldly possessions in order to seek enlightenment and understand life. Well, when he sees these things, he sees a, a stark contrast from what he saw in the royal palace versus what he saw in the kingdom. What he saw in the kingdom was when he saw this sickly person, he saw this disgruntledness, this anger and this frustration. And he had to ask his royal attendant, like, what's going on over there? That guy, what's going on with that person? And he's like, oh, they're sick, so they can't work. They can't make money. They're not going to be able to afford food. And that's why they're upset. And he's like, whoa, like that's new to him because he didn't understand that he lived this life of luxury in the palace. And then he saw this aging person, kind of older and decrepit. Their bones were protruding, having difficulties walking. And once again, there was this agitation and frustration uh, that was going on. And he had to ask his chief of staff, his, his royal attendant, you know, what's going on over there? And he's like, oh, they're getting older and decrepit. They can't move around as easily. They're, this is what happens to us as we get older. And, um, you know, the, these people are disgruntled because of that. And he didn't understand that. He thought life was just this great, wonderful life because he lived all these central pleasures in the palace. Then he saw this dead corpse and the person was dead. And he had to ask his royal attendant, like, what's going on? You know, what's happening over there? He didn't even realize that at the end of this life that he was going to die, right? At the age of 29, he was so sheltered that he never was exposed to that kind of thing. And he saw the grief and the sorrow and the misery around this dead corpse with the family grieving. And he had to ask his royal attendant, you know, what's going on over there? And then the royal attendant explained it to him. Oh, this is what happens when you die. And the family is very sorrowful because they've lost their family member. And this has a big impact on him. And what he sees in the palace is he sees all this misery and despair. And 
he, or I'm sorry, in the kingdom, he sees all this uh, misery and despair where in the palace, everything was wonderful and great for him. So he sees this stark contrast between palace life versus what was going on in the kingdom. And then he eventually sees this roaming aesthetic. We would refer to this person as an ordained practitioner or a monk, right? And this person has given up worldly possessions and they're going off on this journey to try to get to enlightenment. You don't need to give up your worldly possessions to get to enlightenment, but that's what some people choose to do in order to ordain. But you can get to enlightenment in the household life too. But he sees this person making their way uh, and trying to train their mind and trying to get to enlightenment. And he has to ask his royal attendant, like, what's going on over there? What's that person doing? And he's like, oh, this person is trying to figure out what's going on with all this sickness, aging, and death. And so Hartu Gautama decides in that moment that that's what he would like to do, that he wasn't interested in ruling over this misery and despair in the kingdom, that he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in helping the people get out of this misery and out of this despair. So he ends up going back to the royal palace and he decides to leave in the middle of the night at this time, he has a wife and he has a young infant child. His child's just an infant. And he didn't understand his mind. He didn't understand the world the way he ultimately did by the time he got to enlightenment. But he understood it enough that he felt like if he woke them up and kissed them and hugged them and said goodbye and told them that he was leaving, that he wouldn't be able to leave. So he decides that he isn't even going to wake them up. He just kind of looks in on them and then just kind of leaves. And he takes with him his royal attendant and he takes his horse with him. And then when he leaves out of the palace, he ultimately gets to a point where he lets his horse go. He tells his royal attendant that, you know, you can go, you know, you've been a great royal attendant, you know, I'm going to go off on my own now. And he ends up cutting off his hair. At this time, if you were a member of the royal family, you would grow your hair very long. Even the males, they would grow this very long flowing hair. This is how people understood that you were a member of the royal family. That if you went out into the, into the kingdom and you had this long, beautiful flowing hair, they knew that you were part of the royal family because it's only the royal family that would be able to sit around and have servants to comb their hair, shampoo their hair, detangle their hair, take care of their hair. Those of us who were commoners who were working in the fields, we wouldn't be able to have that long flowing hair because it would get all knotted up and tangled because we're working out in the fields. So it's only the royal family that would be able to do that. Nowadays, they just take a picture of the royal family and they put them around the kingdom so you can see who's the king and who's the queen and who's part of the royal family, but they didn't have that technology then. So they would grow their hair very long so that people would know that they're a member of the royal family. So cutting off his hair is like a way of saying, I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the royal palace because people would never believe that he was a member of the royal family. They would never believe he was the king. If he tried to assume being the king, nobody would ever believe that because he grew his hair for 29 years and now he cut it off. And this accomplishes other things for you by cutting off your hair. You don't need to cut off your hair to get to enlightenment. It's not required, but it's one thing that you can do in order to help you. It accomplishes something that we're going to talk about tomorrow called realizing non-self. So not everybody needs to cut their hair, but this is one of the other things that happened for the Buddha to be able to be able to get to enlightenment is cutting off the hair, that it changed the mind not to associate with this body as being who you are as a person by not being, uh, not clinging to your self image. But nonetheless, as the Buddha goes on from there, he ends up deciding to go take training with two different teachers. First, there was one teacher that he trains with for about a year. And this teacher te is teaching him uh, how to get to enlightenment. At least that's what the teacher shares. That in this region of the world, there were various teachers that were claiming that they figured out how to get to enlightenment. And they were teaching people how to get to enlightenment. And what they were teaching Siddhartha Gautama was to hang himself upside down from trees, to lay on beds of nails, to starve himself, to pierce his body with metal implements. And the thought was that if you could cause physical pain to the body and your mind could overcome that, that then you would be able to get to enlightenment. And Siddhartha Gautama did this training with the first teacher for one year. And this teacher said, wow, you've mastered my teachings. You can now share my teachings. You're a master of my teachings. And Siddhartha Gautama realized that his mind wasn't any more peaceful than it was prior to learning with this teacher. And even though this teacher claimed that he had mastered his teachings. So Siddhartha Gautama knew that he hadn't gotten to enlightenment because his mind wasn't peaceful. It wasn't joyful. So he goes and studies with the second teacher. 
And this is another year of training. And the same thing occurred. They taught him to hang himself upside down from trees and a little bit of differences here and there, but nonetheless disparaging the body because the thought was to cause physical pain to the body, overcome that with the mind, and then you would get to enlightenment. And after one year, the same thing occurred. This teacher declared him a master of his teachings. And he said, hey, you can share my teachings. And Siddhartha Gautama realized that his mind wasn't any more enlightened than it was when he was in the royal palace. So he gets frustrated with the whole thing, right? Because he's not enlightened yet. So he's still getting frustrated and he decides to go off on his own and he goes into the forest on his own. But the only thing he knows how to do is the same things that he was taught. So he takes this causing physical pain to the body to the farthest he could take it all the way to the point where he was eating one grain of rice per day. He was barely sustaining his life because as he was doing this, he thought that if he could cause physical pain to the body, he would overcome that and he would be able to get to enlightenment. So he took it as far as he could take it by just eating one grain of rice per day. If you've ever seen artwork of the Buddha with his ribs protruding and his stomach sunken in, his facial bones protruding, it's depicting that period of time in his life where he was starving himself. And he was taking this so far that he was actually just about ready to die when there was this mother and this young child that came by and they saw him and they offered him some rice and they begged and pleaded with him to eat this rice because they could see that he was about to die. And he reluctantly accepts this rice and he starts eating the rice and he has this realization. He realizes in that moment that if he continued down that path of causing physical pain to the body, that he would die. And that if this body died, he wouldn't be able to train the mind. It wouldn't be possible. But he also realized in that moment that when he was back in the royal palace, living all with that sensual pleasures, that that wasn't going to lead to enlightenment either because he was living this lap of luxury. So he kind of had these two extremes in the palace, this central pleasures and living this marvelous life of having all the material possessions that he could ever think about. But then he went all the way to the other side where he was disparaging the body, eating one grain of rice per day. And he realizes each of those extremes isn't going to produce enlightenment. So he starts to develop what's called the middle way where you bring the mind to the middle. And he starts after he gets to enlightenment and he actually teaches, he teaches about like a musical instrument, that if you had a musical instrument that was like a stringed guitar and the string was too loose and you plucked it, the instrument doesn't play beautiful music. It doesn't play the way the instrument was intended to play because the string is too loose and you pluck it and it's like boom, 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 boom. But then if you tune the string too tight and you pluck that, it doesn't play beautiful music there either. It doesn't play the way the instrument is intended to play. It's only when you tune the string perfectly in the middle that the instrument plays beautiful music the way it was intended to play. And he figures out that the mind is essentially the same thing that the mind needs to be in the middle. If you're on either side of the extremes, that the mind doesn't perform optimally. So this really like moves his practice forward in developing his mind and be able to get to enlightenment. So over the next four years, he ends up getting to enlightenment, a total of six years. Those first two teachers didn't actually lead to his enlightenment. So he ends up leaving from them, but ultimately over the six year journey, he gets to enlightenment and he attains enlightenment. He knows he's attained it because his mind's peaceful. It's calm, it's serene, it's content with joy. He doesn't experience any more discontent feelings whatsoever. It's physically impossible for the enlightened mind to experience anger, or sadness, or any of those other discontent feelings. So at this time, when he gets to enlightenment, he realizes that his teachings are very different than what's going on in that region of the world. People are teaching them, you know, their students to hang themselves up, up down from trees, to starve themselves, to do all these disparaging things to the body. And his teachings aren't that. So he ends up going to this tree and he hangs out at this tree for seven weeks, contemplating whether or not he should share these teachings with other people or not. He didn't know whether the world was ready to understand these teachings. So he stays at this tree for seven weeks, trying to decide whether or not he should actually share them with other people. Well, ultimately he does decide to share them. And what he does is he goes back to the area where he was studying with those first two teachers. And when he's on his way back to that area, he encounters four of his previous classmates and one of his previous teachers. And when these five people see him coming, they start laughing at him 
at him. They start mocking him and joking him. But by the time you get to enlightenment, that's not going to shake up your mind. He wasn't affected by that. But the reason why they were mocking him and joking him and laughing at him is they saw that he had meat on his bones. Because to them, in order to get to enlightenment, you need to be starving yourself. So when they saw that he had meat on his bones, they thought that he had given up and that he wasn't making his way to enlightenment. So they start laughing at him and joking him and mocking him. So what he does is he comes over to where they're at and he sits down on the ground and he takes his hand and he touches the earth. And when he touches the earth, he calls these animals. He performs a miracle. This is the first and only miracle that he performs. He touches the earth and these animals come to where he's at. The squirrels, the rabbits, the birds, the snakes, the deer, different animals are coming to where he's at. And these five people saw what he just did and they're like, okay, you've got my attention, you know, and they sit down and they listen to him and he shares with them the four noble truths, which I'm going to share with you tomorrow. The problem in the unenlightened mind, the cause of that problem, the elimination of it and the path forward. And the four noble truths are taught in such a way that you can independently verify it. So when he taught these first five students, these first five aesthetics, they could independently verify that he had indeed discovered what causes the problem of discontentedness in the mind and that he had indeed discovered the elimination of that. You'll be able to do that tomorrow when I share it with you. You'll be able to independently reflect through your own direct experiences and see the truth of what's truly causing these discontent feelings. So those first five people were his first five students, his four previous classmates and one of his previous teachers. And they were then learning and developing from there. A Buddha doesn't perform miracles. They perform usually one miracle in order to help an initial group of people to know who they are because they're going to be influential in helping them. But from that point forward, he didn't perform a whole bunch of miracles to try to convince people of who he was because it's actually more advantageous to a Buddha that people don't know who he is, that he's not a Buddha. Because if everybody knew that he was a Buddha, They would essentially be on their best behavior when they're around you, right? And one of the powers of a Buddha is that he can observe the mind of other people. And through observing the mind of other people, he can then offer them teachings that are actually going to help them to be able to make their way to enlightenment. Whereas if people were on their best behavior whenever they are around him, then he wouldn't be able to observe the natural state of their mind and be able to help them with teachings that would be able to help them to get to enlightenment. So he only performs that one miracle for those first five students. But then from that point forward, he just shares his teachings and his teachings are independently verifiable through learning, reflecting and practicing. People can see the truth for themselves. So he doesn't need to convince people who he is. He maintained the ability to be able to observe the mind of his students and then be able to help them with teachings. So his teaching career goes from the age of 35. That's when he got to enlightenment all the way to 80 years old when he dies at the age of 80. And he taught for 45 years, sharing the teachings that it took, that he used in order to get to enlightenment, he shared it with other people. And countless people get to enlightenment during his lifetime. And then his teachings were preserved in such a way that after his life, more people got to enlightenment after his death. These are the three main criteria of what makes a Buddha a Buddha is that they get to enlightenment by themselves without the help of any teachers or any guides. They then dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their independently discovered teachings with countless people and countless people get to enlightenment during that person's lifetime. Then they preserve their teachings in such a way that countless more people will get to enlightenment after their death. So you'll be able to get to enlightenment and and you're an enlightened being, but you won't be a Buddha by the time you get to enlightenment because you're not going to meet those three criteria. And there's other criteria too of what makes a Buddha a Buddha. So a Buddha is very rare in the world. The last one that the world's currently aware of existed over 2,500 years ago. So you'll be an enlightened being, but you won't be a Buddha by that point. So he teaches for 45 years and dies at the age of 80, essentially of old age. There's documentation that shows what he died from. There's a lot of myth out there about why the Buddha died, but you can actually see exactly why he died in the Pali Canon. Some people say he ate a poisonous sandwich, which isn't actually true, which is essentially like committing suicide. Some people say this. This isn't actually true. If you see his actual documented evidence, you can see in the Pali Canon why he actually died and how he died. And there was actually a doctor about 20 years ago 
uh, who was a physician uh, previous to becoming a monk, and he actually went through the Pali Canon, and he explained medically how he died because he could see the symptoms that were being described, and he could discern exactly the cause of the death based on what was described. So if you're ever interested in that, I have that in the book series. You can you can see it. So. This sickness, aging, and death is what motivated the Buddha to be able to go on this journey in order to get to enlightenment because he saw this misery and despair in the kingdom and he was interested in solving this of why were people so upset and frustrated and angry and he figures it out. He figures out that the reason why people are so disgruntled when they're sick is because they're craving permanent health. They want to be permanently healthy and it's just not possible. This body is impermanent. And when people are aging, they're craving permanent youthfulness. So they're disgruntled when they're aging. And then when people die and there's grief and misery and despair, this is the mind holding on, wanting the person to be permanently alive. You're gonna learn about this tomorrow when we talk about the three universal truths and the four noble truths. But he ultimately discovers what's causing the mind to be discontent. And he also discovers why people keep experiencing sickness, aging, and death. Because there's birth, there's going to be sickness, aging, and death. If there's a being that is born, there's going to be sickness, aging, and death because of impermanence, that we arise, we change, and we fade away. We can't be permanently healthy, we can't be permanently youthful, and we can't experience permanent life. It's just not possible. So the Buddha discovers the cycle of rebirth through observing his past lives. He can see that he's had countless existences. And by getting to enlightenment, not only is the mind peaceful and joyful, and you've eliminated the causes and conditions that produce discontentedness, but you've also eliminated the causes and conditions that produce rebirth as well. Even this topic of rebirth, you can independently verify it. You may not have the wisdom to know how to do that right now, but it is something that you can independently verify. That's not something that I typically suggest for a student to start out with when they're first getting started on the path to enlightenment. But ultimately, as you get deeper and deeper into your journey to enlightenment, there's the ability for you to learn and reflect and practice to be able to independently verify the cycle of rebirth. The reason why I don't suggest students put that up front is because there's core central teachings that you need to learn and understand in order to make your way to enlightenment. And if you put the cycle of rebirth in front of that, it's going to hinder you from being able to get to those core central teachings. And if you think about your life right now, you're a human being. You're able to get to enlightenment. And what's happened in the past in terms of previous lives, it's in the past. It doesn't matter. What may or may not happen in the future, it doesn't matter at this point because you're in this human life and the goal is to get to enlightenment. So while this cycle of rebirth is something to verify and it's important for you to understand that as you get going further in your journey to enlightenment, at this point in your journey, you, I would suggest that you just set it aside because you would like to approach the core central teachings of the Buddha and that's where you're going to be able to gain the most clarity and most understanding at that point. And as you're learning and developing on this path, you know, keep this in mind that no one ever said that life would be easy, but it's not also not supposed to be tough. Learning Gautama Buddha's teachings, it's not easy. Uh, but learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha will ensure that life is not tough. Because in the unenlightened state, sometimes life can be really tough. You can experience certain grief and misery and despair. So it's life is not easy in the unenlightened state, but it's also not supposed to be tough either. Learning the teachings of the Buddha, it's not easy. It takes learning, it takes dedication, it takes diligence, but it's also not difficult either. And what you'd like to do is just slowly, gradually learn. Uh, if you think about like maybe like a, a coffee, right? If, they, if they're putting water into a drip pot, you just drip the water into the coffee and slowly but surely <clears throat> you brew this better and better quality of coffee. It's the same thing with the mind. If you slowly drip the teachings into the mind over a period of time and you gradually develop your practice, it'll be much more easy for you to develop your life practice and train your mind and be able to make your way to the enlightened mental state. But it just takes dedication, determination, and diligence to work in that direction to build up your practice. And the teacher is here to help you. But as I mentioned earlier, just be sure you always remember that you're in your own independent journey. You're your own practitioner on your own journey to enlightenment. A teacher's here to help you to understand the wisdom that you're going to need to learn in order to get to enlightenment, but it's you that's actually doing the work. Okay, so here, this is everything I have to share on this topic, unless you guys have questions. Just to give you guys a heads up of the way that I teach, <clears throat> I typically teach to a certain level of detail. 
And then as you guys have questions, we go deeper down into it. If I shared with you every single thing that I knew in every single discussion, it would be a pretty long discussion. So I kind of teach to a certain level of detail. And then wherever you guys have interest to penetrate into it more deeply, you ask questions and we'll penetrate into it more deeply. So do you guys have any questions on this topic at all? Um, just because we're live streaming, yeah, if you could use a microphone. Here now about life being easy or tough. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's in the Pali Canon that was written or in some form from the Buddha? Yeah, this is a quote from me. Whenever I have a quote from the Buddha, I will put his name here and I'll put the reference to the Pali Canon. Uh, if I don't have the reference or I don't have the, the Buddha there, I will say to you, these are the words of the Buddha. And if you ever asked me, like, David, where can I verify that those are the words of the Buddha? I will give you the reference. But most of the time when I have the words of the Buddha up here, I will have the reference. And in the books, I have the reference too. So you can go back and verify it for yourself. But if you don't see that, then you can assume that it's from me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good, inspiring yeah. quote. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I say that, you know, life life isn't easy in the unenlightened state. I mean, I had a very difficult life growing up, um, but it didn't have to be that difficult. If I would have learned these teachings early in life, like my son, he's 11 years old, he's learning these teachings, and he's learned these teachings since he was growing up, he's going to have a much different life than what I ever had. And if I would have learned these natural laws, I would have the grief and the sadness and the despair that I had growing up because I see his life, he hardly ever gets angry, you know, very, actually he doesn't even get angry anymore. He'll just get a little bit irritated every once in a while now. Uh, in the past, yeah, I saw some anger, but as he's gradually trained his mind, he doesn't even get upset anymore. He's just so chilled. Um, and he's been that way since he was born, but there were different times where he would experience a bit of frustration or anger here or there. But as I saw that and I helped him and tr helped him learn these teachings and he's trained his own mind, man, he's going to have such a different life. But all of us, we didn't grow up that way. We didn't grow up here in Thailand. We didn't grow up in a Buddhist country learning these natural laws. Um, so as you learn these natural laws, no matter where you come from, no matter what your life is like right now, it's impermanent. You can improve your life. You know, even if you're having a pretty decent life, there's still some improvement. You know, even if you have a little bit of annoyance every once in a while, or you feel disappointed, or you feel lonely or bored sometimes, or any kind of little ickiness in the mind, you can eradicate all of that. By the time you get to enlightenment, you won't even have the slightest ickiness in the mind. You just be joyful all the time. And this is a quote that I use to be able to help you understand that it's not going to be easy, but it's not difficult either. You just gradually, slowly, but surely make your way to, to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have a question coming in on uh, Zoom. Let me see. My eyes are a little bit challenged here. Uh, are there any repeats comparing to the course on Wednesday and Sunday. So this particular course that I'm teaching over the next five days, this is a, the first two months of the group learning program. If you took the first two months of the group learning program and you consolidated it into five days, that would be this course. Because in that group learning program, we're meeting for about an hour and a half, two hours on Sundays, um, and then a little bit on Wednesdays as well. But here we're meeting for six hours a day, essentially. So it's like three weeks in one day, but it doesn't feel like it's being crammed or, you know, you're being, it's being forced down your throat or anything like that. It's just kind of being uh, put together in a, in a more consolidated package. So if you've taken the group learning program or you're planning to take the group learning program, this particular course is that same thing, but put in a more consolidated package. But sometimes students like to learn it in a more consolidated package like this, because you can see more of the teachings in a shorter period of time, and you can kind of get your arms around it. So oftentimes people will take this course and then they will move into the group learning program for continuous learning and ongoing support from that point forward. Let's see, if those of you guys on Facebook, YouTube, uh, you guys can also ask questions by putting that into the comment section and I'll be able to see your question here and then I'll be able to answer it for you. And if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, take our first break 
It's uh, exactly 10 o'clock. And when we come back from our break, we're going to be discussing enlightenment. What is enlightenment? This is where you're going to understand what the enlightened mental state is. I'm going to talk about how you make your way to enlightenment. I'm going to talk about what's keeping your mind in the unenlightened state. I'm going to talk about the four stages of enlightenment and how to gradually make your way to this enlightened mental state so that you'll understand what it is. So since it's 10 o'clock, why don't we take a good 20 minute break, give you guys a chance to use the restroom, talk to with each other. If you need any snacks or anything like that, if you go out the main gate of the temple and turn right, there's a 7-Eleven down at the end of the street. And there's all kinds of other vendors and different restaurants and stuff like that that you can help yourself to anything that you would like. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest to learn and grow. I know that a five-day course, it's a, a good amount of content to learn. So I appreciate your dedication to be learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha. For those of you guys online, I'm just going to turn off the live stream, but then I'm going to reinitiate it after we start our next class, uh, which is going to be here in about 20 minutes. So we'll see you guys uh, after break. Have a lovely rest of your break, and thank you for your dedication over the next week. Sawadee Kap. watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.